Yay. All right. So welcome. Thank, again, please thank the uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library, the Fairview Park Branch, let the, the manager know um, that we are pleased to, to be here. Um, yep, we are meeting in person for 2023-24. If you'd like to get more information, uh, ha have regular information, please sign up for our e-newsletter. Um, and there is a uh, site that you can, you can look at our website and find it there. Uh, so please do look at it or pick up one of our newsletters in the back of the room. Please become a member. We love, that's how we get along and get some funds for doing some of the things that we are able to do. And, um, we would love for you to volunteer as well. We have a whole list of volunteer things that we'd love for people to sign up for. I am going to send around this a uh, clipboard with about 10 pages and each page is a slightly different volunteer opportunity. And I'll get that in, in going in a minute. Oops, it's not progressing. Oh. <laughs> Progress. There we go. All right, so hopefully a few folks will continue to join us. Uh, you know, we had been meeting at 7.30 at the Nature Center for ages, but so changing to seven o'clock is like <laughs> for some folks. So we hope that folks will be able to join us here. And again, please uh, please thank the library for a, 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 their ability to host us. Our e-newsletter, there is the, and we got to remember that, right? You have a photographic memory. Yes. So our e-newsletter or become a member. All right. So our volunteer responsibilities or opportunities, there's just so many things, whether it's writing for our newsletter or helping to revive our education committee or our native plant committee. I'm just going through these pages here, helping with fundraising and friend raising. Uh, I mean, gosh, helping with special events and coordinating them, being bird walk leaders. We need leaders for our bird walk, a refreshment committee. I mean, we can have light refreshments here. So there are a number of things that, uh, and I am going to start it here and it's gonna go around and I'm gonna see it full by the end of the, right? No, just, just take a look and see if there's something that you are interested in helping with. Um, if you're not sure what it, what it all entails, that particular volunteer responsibility or opportunity, just ask. Um, they're listed, a lot of them are listed in the newsletter, which we have in the back. All righty, Michelle. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, yeah, next slide. All right, so I'm going to um, discuss our upcoming bird walks as well as how you can connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. All right, so our next um, bird walk is the second Saturday bird walk. Um, that's the second Saturday of every month at the Rocky River Nature Center. Um, the next one is this coming Saturday, September 9th. Um, and we meet between the upper and lower parking lots. Just look for a group of birders with binoculars. Um, and that uh, walk is led by Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand, who is with us this evening. Thank you, Al. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. These photos are gorgeous. All right. Um, then we have the evening bird walks. Um, we run them uh, through the summer and into early fall, um, the third Wednesday of each month. And our final walk will be uh, Wednesday, September 20th at 6 p.m. at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Uh, Nancy Howell and Al Rand will lead that walk. So, Hope to see you there. And then finally, the, the next um, walk we have at the end of the month, the fourth Saturday of each month, uh, is the Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. Uh, the next one is Saturday, September 23rd at 9 a.m. Uh, we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue. Um, Nancy and Al lead that walk as well. And then finally, um, we are active on social media. Um, we have a Facebook, uh, Twitter, or I think it's called X now. Um, uh, 
Instagram and YouTube. So um, please connect with us in whatever way you use social media. We'd be happy to um, connect with you. All right. That's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Good evening, everybody. My name is Drina Nemes, and I am the book discussion leader. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm happy to say that we're just about ready to start our fourth season, and we have the pandemic to thank for our book club starting. So uh, coming up for this year, and just within five or six weeks, we're going to have our first discussion on the book, The Glitter in the Green by John Donne, all about hummingbirds. And then in January, Vesper Flights by Helen McDonald, and she also wrote H's for Hawk. And then in April, we'll be looking at reading Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard. Simard, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Next slide, please. Well, for this glitter in the green, there's some great resources. They're also in the newsletter, but just going to YouTube, and if you put in John Dunn and glitter in the green, you will get his uh, video that he made. It's like a trailer, and it's an absolutely beautiful short video and the hummingbird city shows are beautiful, but the watercolor background that they have, it's, it's such a pretty, pretty video. And then I wanted to also inform people that the Cornell laboratory of ornithology has that great series, their bird Academy. And they just added this year, a hummingbird course. It's like perfect timing. And it is an outstanding, like all their bird classes, it's an outstanding resource. Um, and it, there's a cost for it. Um, it's about $60, which is, seems like kind of a lot, but they do have sales every so often. And I was able to purchase it for 40, but you can keep it forever, go back to it and, and go through it over and over. It's, it's a fabulous presentation. Um, Glitter in the Green is available at Cuyahoga County Public Libraries and also the Cleveland Public Library. Um, I, I am on hold for the audio book um, with the Cuyahoga County Public Library for like eight weeks, so I'm not sure if I'm going to ever get to it, but wow. I, I do like audio books. Next slide, please. And then also um, another resource is uh, from our good friend David Lindo of the Urban Birder fame. And he has a series called In Conservation With. And uh, he did interview John Donne when, in 2021 when the book just came out. And it's an, an excellent interview. I enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. And then also David Lindo has lots of other interviews with um, authors, naturalists, experts in a variety of uh, ecological topics. So next slide, please. No. Oh, not progressing. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. And then I like to uh, inform people about the environment of the Americas. Yeah, it's a wonderful organization, and they have an outstanding book club that meets usually the third, fourth Thursday of the month, usually in the evening, but sometimes their guests are. Uh, in different places around the world, so they adjust the time. But it is an excellent series, and they feature uh, outstanding books, and they feature the author, too. The author's usually there. And then their big fame, one of the big, biggest things they do is uh, about migration. They put a lot of their energy into migration. Coming up October 14th is the second World Migration Day for 2023. There was one in May, too. So it's an excellent um, organization and they do so much good work. Okay. Thanks, Drina. Um, now your book club, that's via Zoom, is that correct? That's right, it, it's, it's a Zoom. Yes. That's ACM. Yeah, so we send out the Zoom link for that and, uh, and so you'll hear about it if you'd like to attend. Mm -hmm. And we are recording this, so should you not get some of the the websites or the links, you can look at uh, at it um, on YouTube, and uh, you'll be able to to find those links uh, for some of the different programs and and things like that. Drina talked about. 
All right. Uh, Marianne Romito wasn't able to be here this evening. She is the Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Uh, Climate Watch is a, a program run by National Audubon. Uh, basically, there are uh, we go out two times a year, uh, a, a winter climate watch time and a spring, early summer climate watch time. And so we're looking, always looking for people to take a route or a certain area that you do 12 points a, uh, in a certain square. And you'd have to check with Marianne as to what squares are available right now, but she has folks in uh, certainly Cuyahoga County, Lake County, uh, Lorraine County, Medina County, uh, all the way to, um, do, do we, uh, I don't know if it's all the way, yeah, Summit County. Yeah, so there's a number of places that she has climate watchers. Uh, we usually choose one day, so you can notice for the winter climate watch point count, uh, it can go, go do anywhere between January 15th and February 15th. However, we have chosen, or Marianne has chosen one day, Saturday, January 20th, as the date to go out if possible. You don't have to. Uh, you can do any time between January 15th and February 15th, but it would be best if we can get all our data in one day, boom, one and done, as it says. So uh, contact Marianne uh, either by email or by phone to find out more information on how you may want to participate in the Climate Watch. This is to help uh, Audubon and us understand how climate change uh, will be affecting the birds. Um, habitats are changing. Birds are going to be moving further south, further north, depending on the species and how the habitats do change. So this is a long-term thing. Hey, Marianne, guess what? <laughs> that you can talk to Marianne after the program. <laughs> yeah. Boom, one and done. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Amanda, again, was not able to be here this evening. She had her granddaughter in, but we always have bird-friendly coffee for sale. Um, you, we have little cards at the back table for the uh, coffee club, and you order online. Um, and the, we're ordering only four times a year. When we get our orders, um, the large orders go in four times a year, we don't have to pay for shipping, which means we don't have to uh, give the shipping fees to you. So again, order coffee. There's a lot of different grinds. There's a lot of different varieties, dark roast, light roast, decaf. Um, so the next one, next order is going in on October 10th. Please remember that the holidays are coming up. And in January will be our next order going in. So if you don't order for the holidays in October, you're going to miss those holiday gifts that you may want to give. So think about that too. Nancy. And um, Amanda has joined us, joined us through Zoom and she says we are nowhere near the ounces needed to get free shipping. So please, please, please put in coffee orders ASAP. There you go. Thank you. Thanks. Alrighty, and I did want to announce a couple of our other programs that are coming up in October. We have Tom Baldwin, a master bird carver and carving instructor. Uh, he is going to be talking about the bird within. So he gets that piece of wood and he gets that bird in his mind as to what he wants to carve. He's going to show some of his, and he's going to bring some of his carvings as well, too. He's done, uh, he's won many, 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 many awards, and he's a great instructor. And that is on Tuesday, October 3rd, live right here. November, the library is being used as a polling place. Yeah. Hence, it's going to be closed. So we will have our Zoom or our program via a Zoom presentation. And that is to be determined at this time. But we will be sending out information on the Zoom link, either uh, both through our quarterly newsletter as well as our weekly e-newsletter. So just to let you, just kind of give you a, a warning, Tuesday, November 7th. 
please vote. But this evening, we are so pleased to have Lucy McKernan, environmentalist and wildlife advocate. I put that in recently because she is an advocate for wildlife, whether it's deer, whether it's birds, whether it's uh, whatever. So, um, but very, very interesting. You know, we hear about uh, a lot about birds colliding with buildings downtown, but we often forget about our own homes. And this is what Lucy is going to really share with us, how we can get that information uh, to make protect birds from with our own homes. So, oh. Um, the Kirtland Bird Club is giving away the books and I've got a supply of them in the back in that little box. So please help yourself. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> All right, excellent. Please bear with me for one moment while I get Lucy's presentation pulled up. And I will get the lights. Maybe I can just introduce myself. Oh, oh. thanks, Nancy. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me better now? A little better? Yeah. It's, it's on. Can you hear me better? Okay, okay. thank you. Give me one second here. Close that. This one over. Here we go. I just got to see it. <laughs> and then, oh, I can't even see it. I know it's one of these buttons. You want the four buttons, the four buttons. right there. Right here? If you want the one before. Oh, no, no, no. I want no, presentation. The one that uh, looks like a little podium. Hold on. I have oh, to. I yeah. I, right there. There. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember where it was. All right. And I can't see it from right here. There. Perfect. Okay. So now I just need to share it on. Let me just check. One more back. Okay. Thank you. Let me. Here it is. Okay. I can use a clicker unless you want to. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And then I just need to make sure that it is sharing. Yes, it looks like we're all set. Thank oh, you. Michelle, thank you. I couldn't have done this tonight without the help of Michelle and the other people with the tech stuff. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me present tonight, Nancy, and the rest of the group members. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you something that is very close to my heart. Um, this all started for me. Um, well, I've always kind of been a birder, um, an amateur birder. And the thing that really broke my heart was in, I think Charles is my husband back there, wasn't it around 2009? I was actually looking into the idea of patenting my own window film with, that would be made from, I can tell you this now because it's not a secret anymore. It would have been made out of a biopolymer instead of PVC um, for environmental reasons. And you kind of know what was happening around 2008 to 2009. I got my uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I got everything officially ready to go. I had a guy from Akron, Akron, who was a polymer expert. I had, um, um, everything but the funding because of the recession that lasted pretty well into the first couple of years after 2008. So that never took off. Um, but my passion has never wavered caring for the birds. Um, it's one, probably my first love for animals is birds, um, so the day that I was going to the library to do research on the patent, wouldn't you know the day I was going and we were walking out the door, a male robin collided with my sunroom window and died. I have goosebumps now even thinking about it. So, um, you know, I just, that was what, 14 years, 14 and a half years ago, and lots of has happened since then. I never gave up on the birds. I kind of put the whole getting my product patented on the back burner but I never stopped retrofitting our windows on our home and experimenting with different things and being a birder. And so this is a distillation of um, more recent interviews I've had with some of you, I'm sure have heard of Dr. Daniel Clem Jr., um, Sarkis Acopian Bird Center. And he wrote the book, Solid Air, Invisible Killer, Saving Billions of Birds from Windows. I'm gonna pass this around a little bit shortly. Um, so my presentation is probably about 40 minutes long at the most. I only talk for about a minute about each slide and we'll have questions at the end. Um, only one of these slides is a little bit graphic. Um, I want you to understand what's going on here. Birds do die. Birds get injured. Even when they don't die, they can't feed themselves because of injured bills or um, 
uh, other injury concussions. And um, so this is really important to me. And I hope that you will understand it's a call to action to all of us to retrofit our windows in our homes. Okay, so reflecting on challenges and solutions for preventing bird window collisions in residential landscaping. I'm gonna to touch a little bit, can you all hear me now still? I'm gonna to touch a little bit tonight on what FLAP and Lights Out are doing. I'm not an, uh, a volunteer with them, but I have the utmost respect for what they do. If it weren't for some of the research and collections of carcasses that they do, we wouldn't even have as much information as we have about which windows are the most uh, risk threat for birds and things like that. But um, yeah, so this is actually a, a copian bird saver. You've probably heard of the Zen curtains before. This is outside of the sunroom window in our home. Um, and I see my nephew just came in and he may remember he used to sell windows and he was trying to get me to replace that whole window. What we did was we replaced the glass instead a couple of years ago. And we put up the same day, this is key, you must put up the same day that you put in new windows or glass, put up window film or some kind of deterrent. Um, and the same with native plantings. We'll get more into that later. But these are beautiful. They sway in the wind. They're very attractive. It only costs about $75. And you can make your own out of twine. You don't have to spend the money if you don't want to. So next slide, please. Okay, so you may notice this dead bird here. It looks like uh, a house sparrow. I'm not sure. Um, this is, uh, I'm not going to name the store, but it's in North Royalton. And I was going there to shop one day a few months ago and I saw this dead bird and I did not miss the opportunity to talk to the store owner who's in a plaza and has to answer to the, the owner of the building. But I provided him, I followed up and I provided him through email, all the information that he might need to help to retrofit the windows. So you can see cars are reflected here in the glass. You can see some of the products that are inside. Um, the bird obviously hit the window and died there because the bird perceives a continuation of landscape. That's one reason why birds hit windows. Reflections and the other reason is fly through. Um, but we know that 1 billion birds die every year just in the United States from window collisions. And approximately half, maybe a little less than half are from uh, on residential windows. And that's what this program is about tonight. So Michelle, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of information here. That's my kitties, Henry and Grace. They're never allowed outside. Never, never, never allowed outside. And that's one reason is because they kill birds. All right, um, so why do windows pose the biggest threat even more than climate change or cats? That sounds like a, like kind of fighting words in an Audubon Society meeting. Um, uh, not looking for a fight here, but I do want to point out that the, some of the data is skewed about cat predation on birds because birds hit windows sometimes first and are stunned or dying or dead and then birds sca uh, cats scavenge them or other animals scavenge them and carry them off so outdoor cats have been blamed for as many deaths as windows but we now understand that they frequently prey on birds who've already collided um this is important daniel clem whose book i mentioned before um talks about how the main point here is in quotations, our residential windows are knocking off the strongest and most common bird species in astronomical numbers. And the key part about this is that unlike climate change, predation or other mortality factors, windows take the strong as well as the weak. And that's what makes windows a particularly oner onerous problem for birds and their populations and survival. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so you may recognize this bird if you've been to the aviary in Pittsburgh. I went there the first time. It was really exciting for me in May. I went there and um, some of the birds walk right up to you and the other ones just kind of fly away. Um, but I really like this picture. And I don't know if you can see, but the windows were retrofitted by Walker Glass. When you walk into the Pittsburgh, the National Aviary in Pittsburgh, one of the first things you'll see is a big display educating the public about uh, what an issue it is for birds colliding with windows, okay? So they obviously are not stupid or suicidal. They've been around a lot longer than we have, so they've been doing something right, all right? Um, so uh, the clues, the visual clues are missing. They either see reflection or they see an opportunity to fly through. Now, if you look at this picture, what I like about it is there's a corner with windows. If a bird sees an opportunity to fly from through something like a corridor, a corner of a building, 
he'll, he'll hit the window. So what I like about this is the Walker glass retrofit was a pretty big deal when they did this not long ago um, on the whole building. So transparency and reflection are both factors in birds hitting windows. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this picture is from the inside of the solid, this, uh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it much in the dark, but I'm gonna pass it around anyways. It's the, it's Dr. Clem's book. It just came out about a little under two years ago. And uh, I did a lot of research. I interviewed Dr. Clem. Um, this picture is from that book. And you'll notice a lot of hummingbirds here. I don't know if you can see, see their long beaks, the hummingbirds. Does anybody here know why so many hummingbirds die from window collisions? Anybody? The old rule for uh, retrofitting windows, and it's still okay to do this. It usually works most of the time, but the best practice is two by two, two inches by two inches horizontal vertical to cover your window exteriors. This bird, hummingbirds die um, even when you do just two by four. In other words, they could still try to fly through four inches. So two by two is now the recommendation. Um, so anyways, there's billions of square feet of window glass in the United States. Both homes and tall office buildings can be problems. The sheer number of homes and glass windows makes this one of the biggest killers in the United States. So I have some notes here I wanna to get to just for a second. Um, and again, I wanna give a shout out to both FLAP um, Fatal Light Awareness Program, the acronym FLAP, and the Lights Out Program um, for, for getting the word out about window collisions and light attracting birds, especially migratory birds. So many birds are drawn in and mesmerized by those lights and they, they eventually collide with the glass or die from exhaustion. And this is a really big deal. Um, the problem is there's more focus now in the birding world on protecting or conserving bird populations in urban, densely, you know, tall buildings, skyscrapers, those kind of things. How do you address the challenge? And I don't have the answer to this. I'm only giving you some ideas here tonight. How do we address the challenge of all these homes, 100 million homes approximately in America, United States are spread out across the land. And there's no mandates like there is in New York City for new building structures to include uh, bird-friendly safe glass when they're being built or to retrofit them or Chicago, which has adopted the same, the same policy New York now has. So it's one thing to be able to address it on a metropolis level, but to address it on a residential level where people must voluntarily care about the birds and do something about it. That's a whole other ball game. And that's what the biggest challenge is. So next slide, please. All right, so um, just, I'm not really big into technical stuff, but I did think this was a little fascinating about bird's vision. Um, they have single and double cones in their eyes. Their cones contain droplets specialized for light absorption of color. And the pigments in the droplets filter out and narrow certain light wavelengths, which means they perceive UV light. And some of the, the tapes that I'm gonna pass around in a little while have a UV to them, some of the ABC bird tapes and feather friendly. Um, and that may hold potential for protecting them from windows. Uh, Dr. Clem, the, uh, Daniel Clem, the book I was passing around, that I, there's a little bit of a disagreement in the, in the bird conservation community, at least what I perceive between um, using window films and bird safe glass that meets the threat criteria when you're putting new glass in to prevent bird window strikes, there's a, there's sort of a difference between that and UV. And I guess we're not still 100% sure how the UV works, but it does hold promise. And that's pretty much all I know about that. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the sad one. This is the, I think, is this a woodcock? Does anybody know? It's a woodcock. It's a dead woodcock. You can see the blood in his eye and the blood coming from his bill. It's the only graphic picture I have tonight, and I'm sorry about that. I want people to know this is um, what happens when a bird hits a window. It has a concussion and it dies or it dies elsewhere. People might say, well, I only have one bird strike a, a year. Why should I change my glass or put something on my windows? Because <laughs> that's one bird that just died. That's That should be enough reason. But also because for every one bird that hits your window, probably 10 more fly off that you don't know about that hit the window and die somewhere else or are pre preyed upon by cats. I'll stop for a second to say I've retrofitted every window in our home. 
I, I think there's some room for improvement. There might be a couple spots that I need to tighten up the two by two rule. We found, uh, my husband found a female goldfinch in our front yard Saturday evening early, and she was breathing really heavily, which was the, the death throes. And we don't know what happened to her. We don't know if a hawk used his talons on her and then flew off. We don't know if she hit a car window. We don't know if she hit one of our windows. I don't think so. Or some other, maybe a fight with another bird. Um, but we can go to the next slide because I know this one's really disturbing. That's the, oh, that's the only one like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, movements to prevent collisions in dense urban areas like flap and lights out. Have we talked a little bit about this, but I wanted you to see these pictures because it shows you the vegetation on the lower levels. These are lower levels. The first four floors of any structure, residential or commercial, are the biggest threat. And that's where approximately 45 to 50% of all bird window strikes occur on the lower four floors. And as, the, as you go up in the buildings, the fewer strikes you have. It's a kind of a converse relationship. And I just kind of like that one because it's pretty. So I put it in there, but it's not pretty to the bird. You know, um, it's beautiful for us to look at, but it's not, it's not beautiful to find a dead bird. So the next picture, please. Um, Okay, so we talked a little bit about ABC and Dr. Clem. There's other groups that have done a lot more on the research on where the bird, most of the bird strikes are occurring on the first three to four floors. And guess what? That's residential, right? That's what we're talking about tonight. Um, the, and there's Jim Cuby. I don't know if we have that in here. I'm supposed to be talking a, bit, a little bit about my notes here, and I'm really forgetting about my notes. But Jim Cuby, who's a retired senator and a birder, maybe you've heard of him. He talks a lot about when you put in native plantings in your yard or your residential area, whatever it is you're managing, whatever property, that very same day you need to retrofit the windows, not one day later. Because when you're putting in native vegetation or any vegetation, you're attracting more birds and therefore you're increasing the risk to the animals. So if you love birds and you care about birds and you want them to survive, make sure you retrofit your windows. We'll get into the DIY real soon here. So you, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is the backside of the Pittsburgh aviary, and you probably can't see, but these are uh, rut these are walker glass also, and I'm not sure what kind. I have samples. This is so heavy, I'm not going to pass it around. This is walker glass samples. Anybody who wants to come and see these after the presentation, take them out, get your fingerprints on them. I don't mind. You're welcome to look at them. They have um, etching and fritting that break up the reflection. You can still see the reflection, but it's broken up enough that the birds won't hit it. Okay. So again, this just explains the converse relationship of the lowest level floors are the highest rate of mortality. Yes. I'm just wondering about screens. You can use screens. Screens are great. Screens and solar shades. Yeah. And you can use suction cups to attach them on the outside. And I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about screens too, as one of the DIY measures. Um, and again, I, get, I keep giving a shout out to Flap and Lights Out. There's volunteers, Tim from Lake Erie Nature and Science Center and other people who get up at 5.30 in the morning and they go downtown Cleveland and they collect these bird car carcasses. Anybody here who's done this? Anybody here who's volunteered to do that? Michelle? Hi, Michelle. Thank you. Because that's where we got a lot of information that, you know, about the lowest level floors. And... Um, Probably those downtown buildings, though, it's more the lights than it is necessarily the floor level. Would you would you agree with that? The it's the lights that are attracting them. Yeah. Right. And then sometimes they hit the windows. Sometimes they don't. Okay, thanks. That's a little fuzzy for me that part. Um, but again, that shout out to all the volunteers who've done that because that's where we get a lot of the information that we have. All right, so basically four to 11 stories is 54% of total bird strikes. So well, there's a lot of buildings downtown that are at least four to 11 stories, and that's a good percentage of bird strikes. But it just, it just strikes me, no pun intended, as very strange that the lowest floors are the ones where we're having the most strikes until I realize it's the vegetation and the reflection of the sky. You can go to the next slide. All right, why do we care about birds? Seed dispersal, pollination, public health, scavengers. In India, weren't the weren't the uh, vultures eating people's body? I mean, that's how they would dispose of human bodies. Indicators of environmental health, 
right? They're in the indicator species, pest control, beauty and cultural symbolism and meaning. We love birds. We love to look at them. We love to take trips to Costa Rica to, to go look at birds. We spend a lot of money birding on birding books, binoculars, trips, and that's tens of billions of dollars. And that's a quantification that, um, that doesn't have anything to do with the birds themselves. They don't care how much money we're spending on them. They just want to survive, right? Um, but it is an interesting note that it, birding ranks only second to gardening um, as the one of the high, biggest hobbies. Next slide. And then why else should we care? You see that little word there? It says love. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Um, we should be valuing them as rightful stakeholders themselves, free to exist without harm or being commodified or used as a natural resource. Um, we're not all, you know, I know some people here are like, uh, you want to get the birds on your life list, but it's really about protecting the birds and conservation. And that's what I like about Audubon Society is so, it's so much about that. It's not just getting, uh, checking off a bird on your list. So we want to transform our thinking if it's not already from users of a natural resource to protectors and defenders. So does anybody know what this native plant here is that's in front of my house? Anybody? Wingstum. Try one. Oh, it looks like wingstem. I just learned that one at the nature's preserve the other day. I just learned that plant, but no, it's it's tall like a wingstem, but the plants form cups around the stems, the, the, the cup plant. And boy, are these invasive, but I love them because because at the, right now, all the flowers have died back. They're beautiful in this picture, but all the flowers have died back. Um, and the goldfinches come in hordes to eat the, the, uh, the seed. And then I spy on them out of my little octagon window. Now, if you're gonna, if you're gonna uh, hit me with a rubber noodle tonight, that's the one you wanna hit me with because I haven't covered that window, that little tiny window there. And you know, I really need to cover it, but I can't get to it right now because there's so much vegetation. Um, but that's just one view of the front of our house. You can go to the next slide. And here is where, again, you can hit me with that wet noodle because I stretched this out, this photo. It's not as bad as it looks with the distance between the vertical ABC film. Um, it's really more like three or four inches, but I need to take those off and put up the feather friendly. Can you see the dots over here a little bit on the, <laughs> on the sashes? Those are feather friendly. And I'm going to pass that around too. Actually, I'm going to do that now. You can just kind of look through this envelope and you can see the tape. They give you everything you need. It's very inexpensive to put this up. It's feather friendly um, on the outside and it's two by two. And they're just little dots. Um, they give you a squeegee. They give you a measuring tape and they give you instructions. This couldn't be easier. It's, it's never been easier to protect birds from windows. Okay, um, so what are the biggest challenges? People think I don't have time, I don't have money, it's gonna be too hard to do this. It's, I'm not gonna be able to look out my windows and enjoy them. I'm, it's, it's, the city is gonna call and complain. They're gonna find me for having something on my windows. None of that stuff is true, that's never happened. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about retrofitting. If you could go to the next slide. Oh wait, can you go back just for a quick second? I forgot to mention something. You can see the sky and vegetation. This is a large magnolia in our front yard, it's right in the middle of the yard, and the sky behind it. That's what would attract the bird to the glass, right? And just today when I was um, looking out my uh, perpendicular window to the sunroom, I saw a goldfinch fly right up to about this far from the glass and then went straight up over the sunroom because, because the acopian bird savers that I showed you earlier were there to stop the bird. So even though there's reflection in on the glass, it's broken up. And that's why the two by two is important. So you can go to the next slide, Michelle, thank you. Okay, so hawk silhouettes and decals don't work unless they're spaced two inches apart, All right? Bird safe etched, fritted or UV treated glass, not economical due to demand. Again, that's these Walker glass is the one that I researched and I like them the most. Um, it costs about 10, you have to have at least $10,000 investment in a residential setting to get them to put new new windows or new glass in. And, you know, why do that when you can just put up something on the window exterior, which is films made by Feather Friendly, the dots that I just showed you on the sashes or ABC, American Bird Conservancy um, tape, 
And I think Feather Friendly and ABC just partnered to bring new tape in Collide Escape. I'm going to show you that if I haven't already on our other window in the living room. Insect screens. I think you mentioned insect screens before. And you can use screens on the outside as long as it breaks up the reflection. Um, the best way to keep them on there, though, is to use suction cups so they don't just blow down. So I had one window over the kitchen sink that wasn't protected. And last year, some Baltimore Orioles came flying right to, and I was standing there washing dishes and they came right towards me and one almost hit the window and I was, my heart was pounding. So I went out and I grabbed an old screen from the garage and just put it up and it's still there now. I haven't covered that window yet with regular permanent solution, but the, the screen is still there. Um, and we've been looking for, through screens forever. So they really don't interfere with our view. Um, and then Acopian Bird Savers, the Zen curtains that I showed you. And if you have an emergency or you're really cheap, you can use tempura paint or soap, which, but use a plant-based non-toxic soap because it's going to get on the in the soil when you wash it off or when it rains. Go ahead, the next slide, please. Okay, um, so I just throw this in here because people do think about this a lot. When they think of bird window strikes, they think about what the densely urban metropolis is. Um, New York City mandates it, Chicago adopted the same policy. And what I love about this is the US Green Building Council, which has established the criteria for leadership, the lead ratings. ABC, American Bird Conservancy, I think it was Christine Shepard, if I'm not mistaken, got together with um, the US Green Building Council and they came up with a, an architect's uh, design and building like continuing education that you get credits for. I think the name has changed. It may not be um, it may not be what it was just a couple of years ago. But basically it means that a threat vector has to be of 30 or less for I think that's the lower windows, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, which correlates with a window strike reduction by at least 50%. It's better than that. At least 50%. And to be bird safe, 90% of a building's facade, which is the first 40 feet which roughly corresponds with the three to four floors we talked about, it must score a threat factor of 30 or less. Above 40 feet, 60% of materials must meet. And when I say materials, it isn't just glass. I mean, there are other reflective materials used on buildings. Um, there's even, uh, you may have seen these in other cities. I don't see them too much in Cleveland. Uh, glass walkways, you know, or panes of, of, of plexiglass, and those can also be deadly for birds. Um, but that's basically um, what's being done by law now in New York City. You cannot put up a new building in New York City unless it is, meets the bird safe criteria that ABC has established. And I like how Chicago has adopted that. And I wish Cleveland would. And I contact, I went to a county council meeting a couple of years ago and I was trying to get Sunny Simon, who's one of the county council members. She runs the, um, she's the chairperson of the environmental sustainability committee for the Cleveland, not Cleveland, but county council because she said to 200,000 people on public radio that she was gonna do something about preventing bird window strikes on county buildings. So I held her to that at the, at the meeting and you know, it was lip service, of course, you know, nothing's been done and it's been two years. So I can say this though, somebody told me, one of the people I interviewed in the industry who makes some of these products said that they do have a shoe in with the county and they're working on it. So I hope that's true. Yes. They have um, the Justice Center has put up the the dots on the front of the building. So she is oh, success. Has she has. Some of the buildings to oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. You mean uh, one lakeside, the jail? The jail? It's, well, it's the lower part. It's the Justice Center. So okay. It's more than the, jail. the jail is in that building. Right. But the north. Um, the northwest corner of the building. Okay, thank you. I haven't been there. Yeah, I haven't seen that for a while, and I, I'm going to have to go look at. Was it dots? Was it? Yes. Thank you. That's and really could great. You, could you summarize into the microphone? Oh, sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, she. You want me to repeat her question? Uh, oh, go ahead. She can. She can say it. Thank you. What's What's your name again? She, she's bringing the microphone for you. Thanks, Michelle. You wanted the information about the uh, the building downtown, the Justice Center, the first floor of the Justice Center, one of the corners, I think it's the north 
northeast corner has been treated. The northwest corner, the other one, one of them hasn't, the other one has. I can't remember which one, which way it is right now, but they have put the treatments on. And I think they're looking at other buildings for things that, that can be done. But those went up at the end of the spring. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great news. Do you have a comment? Yes, I just wanted to ask Michelle if you knew anything about the Sherwin Williams building and and what's been worked out with. Do you know, no, Nancy? No, no, no. 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 Oh, okay. I know. I heard about that. It was a really big movement. So a lot of people tried to get that get Sherwin Williams done. Yeah, we don't know if just they're going to just work on the bottom few floors or. At least what we heard is there are few places that they're going to try treatments. It's not as much as we had hoped. You mean on Sherwin Williams? Right. Ah. Okay. It's thank you for that. And it's really complicated because even when I went to, to county council, I was pretty naive. I went in there and I just said, I brought the Walker samples with me. And I said, can you do this? And they were like, you can't just bring samples in here. It's we have to go through a whole, the government has to go through a whole thing. It's, it's like they're, then they would be guilty of somehow favoring one company over another or something. So, um, but I do know, thank you for that, both of you. And I'm, I'm glad something is being done. Um, on the larger scale, the commercial buildings, because it needs to be. Okay, thank you. And we go to the next slide. Uh, bird safe residential glass. So we talked about this. Um, if you have the money, this is the way to go. $10,000 minimum, at least the last time I checked a year or so ago. Walker glass. I'm not supposed to be promoting one company over another. I like Walker glass. I met with the people, the reps. I did research. Walker glass has the best, um, it meets the best threat factor. So has anyone here heard of Ornolux? I think it's a German glass manufacturer. And I heard from people, I don't want to name names, but the people I interviewed when um, I, I wrote an article that's going to appear in next June's Mother Earth News about this issue. And when I was interviewing for it, one of the people told me Ornolux, it doesn't always work. Maybe, uh, anyway. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so here's, okay, this is what I wanted to show you. This is Kaleidoscape in the middle. Kaleidoscape is just one sheet, okay, and it's perforated. And on the outside, it breaks up the reflection. It's pretty radical. Some people may not want that on their windows. Um, if you don't want that, then you can just, you can see the the AB, or the uh, feather-friendly dots over here on the upper sashes. Below is the screen, so I don't need any protection. So it's a combination. I've had zero strikes. That ABC or that kaleidoscape film in the middle, the large picture part, has been up for almost 16 years. And I've had no problems with it and no window strikes, none that I know of. There was one time a Cooper's Hawk was trying to take a morning dove and the morning dove glanced off of it because they were warming on my porch. They didn't have anywhere else to go. And there was, it's kind of, but the bird didn't have a serious injury and he just flew off. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this is the same window from the inside, right? Right. You can see the line right down here. It's just nothing more than a screen. And you can see the feather friendly dots. You kind of, I kind of messed up here a little bit when I was putting them on <laughs> a little to smash the first couple lines together, but that's to me, I'm so used to it. I don't even notice it anymore. And, um, I just love it. And, and I'll probably keep that up until it just curls off and falls apart. Just, I think it was feather friendly, by the way, said that they've been laying down window film for 16 years, 6 million square feet of it. And not one has come to end of life. So I'm jumping around a little bit here. I'm saying feather friendly and ABC and Kaleidoscape, but they're all window films and they all do great work. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, more window films. I think I showed this, this picture to you before. Um, we don't have to stay on this, but it shows you the bergamot and the ironweed and all that in the front, which is vegetation that's being, and then this being reflected in the glass. And it's really important to, I don't know if I'm using this microphone the right way. Um, it's really important to know that, that I really do need to put up something like the, uh, the feather friendly dots here. I'm not comfortable with what's in the middle. It's not, it's not the two by two. You can go to the next slide. It's a work in progress. <laughs> okay, um, you mentioned screens and also solar shades. Um, 
I think this is a solar shade and I just did a really kind of a cheap slop job on this next slide or two, just a screen capture just to show you some pictures of what these solar shades look like. So here's a window with a solar shade on it right next to a window that doesn't have one, which I don't understand that. Um, but it's obvious that one would prevent wor bird window collisions and the other would not. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I included it. And you can use suction cups if you're using regular screens. Go to the next slide, please. More solar shades. I like these because they show you different, you know, you can have different colors and make it real pretty. And um, if you're going to put up solar shades and you want to take them off, you may still need to protect your glass underneath. So just think about that. There's different times of day, different times of year. You can't always predict when a bird may or may not hit the window. So just keep something there all the time. Next uh, slide. Uh, string deterrence. We're back to the acopian. Now this is from the outside. I showed you at the beginning on the first slide, the acopian bird savers. I did not extend them all the way over because I have ABC bird diamonds there that break up the reflection. But this, I like this slide because it shows two things. It shows both a reflection of the landscape. These are horse chestnut trees reflecting in the glass. And then it also shows the fly through. I did say hawk silhouettes don't work, but I left that there just for fun because I still have ABC vertical tape on. This is the other window looking through the sunroom. So a bird would either, this is probably the most lethal part of my home for birds because it has both a fly through and reflection. It's, it's almost all windows, the sunroom. And that's where, that's the window the male robin hit in 2009. And the hawk chasing him just never came back to retrieve him, which was even more sad. Um, so we can go to the next slide and this get prepare yourself because oh, is that hideous, right? Some of the people sitting in this room tonight have seen this window. <laughs> it's really embarrassing, but I put it in here anyways because it breaks up the reflection. Okay. It totally it almost totally breaks up the they may find a few spots here that are more than two inches. This is actually green backer board I put up on the sashes. We have praying mantises galore. We have a wildlife habitat on our property, so we can't even access these windows right now. Everything is all mint and native vegetation and praying mantises, and I don't want to step on one. So when the season is over, I'm going to retrofit the outside sashes or sides of this sunroom window with some ABC, probably feather-friendly dots. And then this glass window is just the glass itself is going to get replaced. And then I'm going to put the acopian bird saver strings over it. Next slide. Okay, and uh, we're getting close to the end here. So if you don't want to spend a lot of money, you can just use tempera paint or plant-based soap. I do not like how, and unless I'm mistaken, and this is a screen here, I think it is a screen now that I can see it larger. I don't like how it's not protected, <laughs> but maybe it's a screen. But you can see that it's easy to make your own designs. It's cheap, um, or you can use plant-based soap. You know, people used to use that all the time on windows. I remember in businesses, they would do that, but not to protect birds. I think they were doing it because they didn't want people to see in. I think we're almost finished. One more slide. Okay. In summary, a billion birds die each year in the United States from window strikes. Many of them on homes, almost half. Birds collide with windows due to two factors, reflection and fly through corridor. Windows may pose the biggest threat because they take the strong as well as the weak birds. And Dr. Clem, I didn't even go into my notes about that because of time tonight, but Dr. Clem really talks about that in his book. I recommend to each of you to get Dr. Clem's book. Um, and he explains how, even though you may think cats are taking the most birds, uh, and they may be, but they're right up there with windows. Because as we said earlier, cats do take birds that have already struck windows that might not otherwise be preyed upon if they hadn't hit the window. Um, and they and and windows take the strong as well as the weak. I mean, let's face it, predation, climate change, all these things are factors for birds, but nothing can take the strong as well as the weak like windows can. Um, so birds' visual systems make them more vulnerable to window strikes, right? So let's turn that around. Because of their visual systems, we think like they do, and we realize we're going to retrofit our windows tonight, starting tonight when we go home. Don't do it in the dark on a ladder, though. You're going to do something, though. You're going to put something up there tonight, right? Or tomorrow. Um, so birds play an essential role in all of our ecosystems. The four first floor, four floors are the highest threat. It's easy, cheap, and affordable. 
birds like other wildlife are held in the public trust. And as equal stakeholders, each of us is responsible for their existence. So we, we, don't, we, we, we move away from user to defender and protector. And what's most unique about this pressing environmental issue, it's the easiest to solve. How many people are sick of hearing about climate change and we can't, you know, the spill, the train spill that ha happened in February, all these things that we, they're so complicated and, and, and politically motivated and, it, and economically layered with comp with, with this, it's just so simple. It's an easy fix and it can save billions of lives and we need you to do it. So this is your call to action. Please retrofit your residential windows. You don't want to hear that thump. It's heartbreaking. I know some of you tonight, you've heard that thump and you, and you love the birds. So please retrofit your windows and, um, and help others to do the same. So there you go. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Ooh, oh, sorry. Ah, I, I, I meant to, I meant to warn everybody. Um, if you have a question, I can bring the, the microphone around so that you can, we can get that recorded. There may be some questions that have come in via Zoom. I don't know if any have, have come in in the chat. Oh. So that one, uh, slide where you had that big picture window and in that white film on it. It looks like you said it looks from the street at, like it's white, but then inside it was very clear. What was that film? You said it's for $80 for 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's it there. Kaleidoscape. Um, if you want, I don't know. Can you still go back, Michelle, or is it too hard to go back on that? We'll go back. Just keep going backwards. And, and the Because that's in like to be the most easiest and simplest solution. I'm going to use this. I, you can have it. it oh, I don't want to take it from you, but it's very much like Kaleidoscape, and uh, but it's a different. I think it's a different company made that. <laughs> no, keep going back till you show the one with my house with the keep about three more. Yeah, keep going. So this one right here, right there, right there. that's Kaleidoscape. Makes the sheets. Um, no, it's self adhesive, I believe. It has a backing on it. Peel that off. That's not Kaleidoscape, but it's like it's a lot like it. Mm -hmm. And there are other companies that make films besides Kaleidoscape that that are sheet film. I think I'm, I think ABC also makes a sheet film. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for asking. As far as that's concerned, um, do you cut it to? the dimensions of each window if you want to put it on there? Good question. Um, no, we just, we measured the window glass itself only and we contact a company and we, and they cut it for you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. My husband helped me to affix it and you can't see it, but we made a mistake putting it on. There's like a tiny little rip on one corner, but we, it, you can't even see it. It's oh, I can see it. <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> and, and the bird's upset too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you... When you want to wash your windows, if that's on the outside. It is. Tell it us is. how you do that. So um, you can't use a harsh chemical because obviously the adhesive will degrade. Um, I'm not as expert on this um, uh, as, as I would refer you or defer to Paul Grulow with Feather Friendly. Has some great information on the Feather Friendly website about how to use um, a non- what's the word, uh, non-degrading cleaner on any window film that's made of PVC. But I would say you can use white vinegar. I've used vinegar. I've used water. I've actually had down here on the bottom dirt and grime. I use um, white vinegar on the bottom. And then on the top, I just use water. You could use like a very, uh, like a Castile soap and that won't affect the, yeah. But you can't have like professional window washing or heavy chemicals on it because that that can definitely. And that's a really good question because I had to do a lot of research on that last year when I was doing the Mother Earth News article. And then I stopped because I made the article about something else. So I didn't delve as deeply into what you can use on larger commercial buildings when they retrofit their windows with adhesive materials. So I need to thank you. I need to learn more about that. So um, 
uh, do things like um, standard window blinds or curtains help, or do they just create more uh, reflection on the outside? You mean on the inside? Yeah. On the inside is not considered um, surface one. Surface one in the industry means exterior, and that's where you can have 100% or very close to 100% success where you're reducing bird window strikes. On the inside, you still get reflection on the glass outside. And at certain times of day, it might break up the fly-through corridor effect, but it's not gonna break up the reflection. I mean, you'd be standing literally inside of your house and run from one window to the next all day long to try, and at night too, because of migrating birds, to try to you know, figure out exactly when the reflection with daylight savings, that it would be, you'd be doing that for your whole life, for the rest of your life. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it, it's just easier to put up a window film and forget about it. So surface one, the exterior is where everything should be going. And it needs, and it needs to be two by two and cover the whole exterior. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you got someone behind nope. you there. Oh. <laughs> So uh, the larger the picture window, and typically large, like rectangular picture windows, obviously would create a lot uh, more issues. Now, lots of windows, like the ones on the left and the right, especially on older homes, the uh, the double-hung windows, the slide up and down, there's sometimes grids. Sometimes the grids are external as well, especially on older, like wooden windows. So with those, uh, if there's like external wooden grids, are those ones that you really wouldn't have to worry about as much as mainly the picture windows and ones with no grids, obviously they're larger. You mean the worse. wooden, it's part of like the wooden grid. Where grids, cr crossbars, yeah, it's like decorative, windows. correct, yeah. yeah. Seen those. A lot of Lakewood homes have those. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. The answer is if a hummingbird can fly through it, it's still a threat to the birds. So yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if, if you've got to think like a bird, if I'm fleeing from a predator or Cooper's hawk is chasing me and that's the only place I've got to go, I'm going to hit that window mm -hmm. unless it's a two, two inch window. Right. Right. So okay. yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it okay. does. Um, yeah. I, I would think the large, the large picture window are definitely a lot more of a Probably commonality a overall threat. though. Yeah. Threat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's got a it. great question though. Yeah. I've actually thought about that, but it has, it's been a while. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, right here. She's got awnings. the mic. I don't need that. <laughs> I, I have awnings. And I haven't had any problems. Okay, so you do know? your awnings come all the way down over halfway the windows? Down. Halfway down. Interesting. Huh, I don't know anything about that. That's good. I still think, though, that if a, if a bird is is... If a bird has nowhere else to go but that window to get away from a, a predator, he or she still might hit the Have you had any window strikes? No window strikes? Never found a dead bird at the base of the... Okay. Yeah. I don't know. But if it's only covering the top half, I would think there may still be some threat there, but it's probably diminished. But by what level, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Oh, wait, one more thing about the, the awning is the, do, does every window have an awning in your home? Which is it facing? What direction? Okay. So it's facing the road. Okay. So, um, I know this person obviously, or I wouldn't know that. <laughs> um, so do you have a lot of vegetation in the front? You do. So if you have trees or shrubs or things like that that are uh, reflected in the window, you're definitely cutting down on the potential strikes for that reason with the awnings there. But maybe just take it all the way home. And um, I have some extra feather-friendly tape in the kit that I passed around too. Or if you want some samples, you can have. Um, I didn't sit, pass these around. I don't know if there's enough time. I'm just gonna pass around some more of the bird window films and tapes. Those are ABC. Um, Anybody else have questions? I would just I was just going to say that maybe we can leave things at a table and people can come up and take a look. Um, Either and, way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's do that. One more question. How about that? We have time for one more. I hope I'm not too ignorant here, but um, are there more incidents at night? They're migrating, of course, but does it make a difference what time of day? I don't know. Um, I know that migration is obviously at night. That's we had a gray cheek thrush hit um, the window that was hideous looking. 
that was the other one. I quickly went out and put stuff up. I used saran wrap before I put the hideous stuff up. It was a Jay gray cheek thrush during migratory season. I found dead under the window and I'm almost sure he was during migration at night, but I don't know. Um, maybe some of the other people here who know more about flap and lights out can respond to that question. Um, because I don't, I don't really know for sure. Uh, I would think that because songbirds are mostly active who are living in your yard ha have already come there for the season. Most of the time it's going to be daytime when the light is reflected in the windows, the, the sky and the vegetation, but definitely migratory birds will hit windows at night too. And if you have a light on inside, that's bad. So that's another reason to cover the window. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. I was just going to say night migration. I think the biggest problem is the light shining through the window out. Yeah. That really confuses the birds. It does. Yeah. And that's, thank you for that. And, and, you know, I don't think a lot about the lights because I just have this up and that's my focus, but that's a really important factor. So yeah, no matter what time of day it is. And this gentleman asked, you know, can I just use blinds or curtains on the inside? Um, well, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what season it is, birds hit windows year round. And that's another reason that makes them such a big threat. Uh, if you have plants inside too, that can attract birds to the window. They might see that plant and try to fly to the plant and hit the window. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. How about a nice round of applause? Thank you. All right, I'm going to flip on the light. Yeah, please, um, if you'd like to take a look at the walker glass, again, there are some other samples going around. Um, the Clem book, uh, Solid Air is up there, so you can flip through that as well. Um, and then uh, there are some free books in the back, a uh, couple of things through Kirtland Bird Club, and you could always drop a donation in our our little basket back there as well, too. So thank you so much, everyone.